Welcome to episode two of the Came Kit Bag. I'm Gavin Buckle. Previously, we chatted to Russell Nugent, the new Came director for 2022, as well as Benny Roo, the 2018 winner of the Came Marathon. We covered topics such as preparation and training, what to expect in terms of the terrain, route, the equipment needed, how to pack your backpack, and training and getting used to the food that will be consumed during the race. Joining me in studio today is Julie Reed and remotely David Barnard. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Morning. Julie completed KM in 2018 and in December 2021 participated in the inaugural Longmore Forest Endurance Runner 50 Miler where she placed third. David has completed 11 multi-stage races from 2010 to 2018. In 2018, he became the first African and one of a small group of people to complete the multi-stage desert race on all seven continents. South Africa, Egypt, Chile, China, Argentina and Iceland are just some of the countries these races took place in. In today's episode, I would like to focus on the participants' well-being in the race, as well as their physical health and mental strength. Paul Dacey, an Irish runner, once said, The Kalahari captures your soul, and it takes seven days in the desert to get it back. But when you get it back, it is different, it is fulfilled, it is life-changing. I've been watching the Came footage since 2015. The landscape is majestic but intimidating. The wild animals are a unique spectacle and the human camaraderie a strong motivator to push towards the finish. These are just some of the motivating factors that made me enter Came 2022. Recently though I read about David's harrowing experience following the 2018 Came due to his ailing health and to be honest i felt quite emotional and rather apprehensive of this year's race david briefly tell me what happened in your 2018 came race yeah that's a that's a long story and an unfortunate story um i should have known better i um i did a race in iceland uh, a month or two before kalari um did it. I thought I was healthy, um, but had the flu a week or two before the race. Um, struggled in Iceland, but um, couldn't quite figure out what was wrong. Uh, came back to South Africa. Things felt better. Um, I was very fit. I went to Kalahari. Um, and again, you know, felt good first day or two. But, you know, by the end of the race, I hardly made it uh, to the end. Um, Bottom line is um, clearly that flu of before Iceland wasn't quite out of the system, and that bug stayed in my stayed in the system. And you know, running 250 kilometers in the cold of Iceland, and then 250 k's in the heat of the Kalahari, it was a um, a toxic combination. And uh, um, you know, I left the race um, with um, some serious heart issues, which was a. Um, a big wake-up call and was probably a lesson for for anyone um, doing extreme sport um, it's hard enough it's tough enough you know make sure that you are healthy before you do it because if it doesn't bite you during the race it may come back to bite you after the race the reason that i mentioned that you have taken part in so many of these multi-stage desert races is to highlight the fact that even though you are so experienced in this type of an event, things can catch you off guard. For sure. Um, and obviously, when you enter these races, you want to finish them. So you're probably fairly hard headed also to do these type of races. Um, probably think you are mentally very strong, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You feel, you know, physically fit and strong. Um, but you also you have to listen to the body, which often is um, easier said than done. Um, and and probably you know everyone have different pressure points about when when you will when you prepare to listen to your body um, or not. But you know if 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 this is your first Kalahari or first extreme race, enjoy the experience. Um, and hopefully you've done you know enough 
you know, training, you, you, you've read up about the race, as you've said, you've watched the videos, you've talked to other runners to, to get a sense of, of what to expect. But I think even if I think back about um, my first desert race, which was the 2010 um, Kalahari Extreme Marathon, you know, and again, you know, knowledge about these races in 2010 is chalk and cheese to what is available today. But, you know, if I think back, you know, how big a novice I was, um, you know, obviously you were excited about doing the race and you meet great people and the, and the people kind of get you to, to the finishing line. But there's a lot of stuff that you're only going to experience, the discomfort of doing a desert race, especially in the Kalahari heat. I don't think you can really prepare for it. You have to experience it and then you probably will be better off next time if you have to do a race like this again. You mentioned the discomfort of the Kalahari heat. In the Gauteng area, in Johannesburg and surrounding areas, we don't experience that dry, intense heat. Is there any way that a person can prepare for such a race in the city and suburbs? 40 degrees heat in the Kalahari. Um, I don't think there's many places in South Africa that you can replicate the heat. So I think the way that you have to make up for that is obviously in terms of your all the other stuff that you can manage, be it say training, you know, this, all the things that you you know you covered in the previous in the previous interview with um, with Benny and Russell, your, your equipment, your shoes, your nutrition, whatever. You know, you have to manage the things that you can manage. The heat, you will quickly learn in the Kalahari how best to to manage that. You know walk, walk, you know, th through the kind of the, the, the sandy river beds or walk an uphill and, you know, slow jog down where, where there is a bit of a downhill or in the shade, whatever, or you get to a water point, you know, take an extra minute or two if necessary, you know, drink an extra sip of water, you know. So I think you very quickly, um, the Kalahari will force you to kind of get get real with the circumstances that you find yourself in. Mm. Um, you know, you, you start 8 o'clock in the morning, so maybe that first hour or two every day is if you want to get moving and you want to cover some distance, that's the best time to do it. When it gets to 11, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, then it gets tough, um, and especially people that's going to walk the race. It's a lot of time on the feet, um, and it's you're obviously going to do it, you know, in the middle of the day and it's going to be hot so you know listen to your body in that sense you know take your water take a break you know take it easy um and again it will be different for for, for different runners you know if you if you run in the front probably you're going to finish long before the heat of the day if you're at the back then you're probably going to experience that heat of the day every day and even more so on the long day where you're going to spend um, more time on your feet because of the distance, but you're also going to exp experience the heat and it's you know, probably at, at its worst. There's no short or easy answer to managing the heat because you, you know, it's like going when I went to run in Antarctica. How do you train for running in, in you know, sub-zero sub um, degree circumstances? You know, you can manage what you can manage. The rest, I think you just have to be also be a bit of street smart in the circumstances that you find yourself. You've mentioned a number of times that you need to listen to your body. What were the telltale signs to your body when you suffered in 2018? Every day I felt good for the first, say, two hours. And then it's like hitting the wall that you... Your mind and your body, you want to move forward, but you have no legs. And I couldn't figure it out why. And it wasn't because, you know, I'm a bad runner or I wasn't fit. So um, maybe I am a bad runner, but at least I, th I knew I was fit enough and I've done it enough. So I couldn't figure out what was happening. So it happened in Iceland and, and maybe the, the, the cold or, or the cool circumstances saved me in Iceland. Um, and then I came back to South Africa and I, you know, I trained even harder and I was even fitter than before Iceland when I came to the Kalahari. And although I had a good first day, as of day two, after the first two hours, I just had zero legs. Plus, obviously, then you, you also have the, the heat and, and the related circumstances. So it was clear to me by the end of the, the, what, the fourth stage, at the end of the, after, after the, the long day, Something was wrong, but still I couldn't put my finger on it. And then obviously, you know, on the on day six and seven, I I really struggled to extend that. Um, you know, I'm probably very lucky that the doctors didn't take me um, 
out of the race or in, in hindsight, it's because of kind of the way the doctors looked after me that got me th- through the last bit of the of day six and obviously almost <laughs> step by step followed me on, on day seven to get me to the finishing line. Um, so if people took me out of the race on day six, I probably would have taken it because clearly something was wrong. But in those circumstances, you know, you, you're trying to figure out what maybe, you know, in the back of your mind, I knew maybe, you know, one and one started making two about being sick before I went to Iceland. But now it's kind of two months later and you think for heaven's sakes by now, it can't be the flu anymore. It must be something else because in more ways than one you feel 100% you just don't have legs um, and then obviously as Julie will tell you the Kalahari or, or these type of races starts playing games with your mind in, in more ways than one and then I think the real mental stuff really kicks in so fortunately and I'm probably very lucky that you know I finish all my races so maybe that in some small way then also kind of help you through kind of those those dark stages that you are going to experience, be it the, your elite runner or your makeup, you know, the field at the back as, as a walker, you're going to have, you know, dark moments and, and maybe there the experience of previous races that you finish all of them kind of give you that bit of comfort or give you that fuzz bait um, to, make it, to make it to the end. Julie, tell me, how does the Kalahari play with your mind? Well, I don't think it's necessarily just the Kalahari. I think it's um, a combination of factors. So it's uh, the distance and um, the difficulty. I mean, normally when you go for a very long run, you wouldn't be carrying a 10 kilogram backpack on your back. That's just, it's crazy. It's not normal. Um, so the, the fatigue sets in a lot faster than it would uh, if you were just doing a, a normal marathon or something like the Comrades. After doing the Kalahari, I always say that the Comrades is like a, a walk in the park. I don't know why everyone goes on about it like it's this crazy thing. Um, so the Kalahari does play tricks on your mind just in terms of the enormity of the landscape. And you start thinking to yourself, well, I, am I actually going to cross this, you know, <laughs> under these circumstances? But I think that um, one of the biggest tips that I could give uh, a, a inexperienced runner who's never done a desert uh, stage race is um, the the key thing that you need to finish is something that's quite unsurprising and something that no, no one ever talks about, and that is patience. That is going to be key. During it, the race? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so it's, it's practicing, having mental discipline, practicing patience. And so why do I say that? And that's because like if, um, if you're just a normal, average, everyday runner, someone who does running as a hobby, and, and you go out and do a, a 10K run around your suburb, or maybe you do a marathon, the, the, those 10Ks will, will take you anywhere between like 40 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes if you're just taking it easy and going slow. So, okay, let's say, let's say 10 days normally takes you like 50 minutes. You get out there into the desert, into the Kalahari, suddenly you're carrying seven days worth of supplies on your back. You're making your way through soft river sand. Um, it's 45 degree heat. And suddenly that 10 days takes you twice as long as what it normally would on any other given day. And you're looking at your watch and you're thinking, but how is it possible that I'm moving so slowly? I've got so far to go. It's going to take me hours to get there if I and then you start panicking because you think well normally this 10k's would would take me such a short amount of time and here it's taking me double the time and then you start thinking oh my goodness patience so you have to accept you are going to move and okay maybe the elite runners this doesn't apply to them but let's face it they're superhuman I'm talking about normal average human beings who run as a hobby who like me have zero natural talent but they run anyway because they enjoy it um, you know it, it is going to take you much longer make peace with that right at the beginning don't let it upset you when you're out there. Just stay patient. And here's the basic natural laws of physics. Whether you are sprinting or running or jogging or walking, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other over and over and over again for many, many hours, you will eventually get to the finish. It is going to take longer than you think it's going to take. Just accept that. Make peace with that from the very beginning. And why I say patience is because it's... It's that. It's exactly that. One foot in front of the other for many, many, many hours. 
Um, and, and if you start getting frustrated during that process with the time that it's taking you to cover the distance, it's going to make it all the more difficult for yourself. So you just have to have that patience and enjoy where you are and enjoy the process. Let's put this in context. If you're a runner and your average speed is 10 kilometers an hour, yeah. if you're a trail runner, so yeah. let's take road running out of it because road okay. running, there are minimal obstacles. So you're a trail runner and your average speed is 10 kilometers an hour. Mm. Considering the thick sand that so many people have mentioned, and you have just mentioned it, and David has mentioned it, what average speed can a person attain? Uh, you mean in the Kalahari? In the now. Kalahari. Okay, so that's going to, and this is something that I think also a lot of people don't talk enough about, that's going to vary depending on um, on who you are as a runner um, and from person to person. And why do I say that? It's because for me, when I started the race, my um, I had too much stuff in my bag, obviously. So my bag was about 10 kilograms, right? I weighed under 50 kilograms at the time. I don't know what I weigh now. But I weighed under 50 kilograms at the time. So now I'm carrying supplies that are 20 percent almost a quarter of my own body weight so that makes it very difficult for me to move quickly if you're a, a, a big tall man and you're 80 kilogram dude and you've got lots of upper body weight and you know l long legs and then 10 kilograms isn't so heavy for you for me it was a disaster so for me, it was literally, it, it translated into double the time that if, if it usually takes me 25 minutes to cover five kilometers, um, it was taking me 50 minutes to cover five kilometers. So for me, it was literally double the amount of time. But as I said, it's going to vary depending on the runner, who you are, how tall you are, how strong you are, how much you have in your bag, um, and obviously how fit you are as well. The recommendation, I think, is that your bag should be approximately 10% of your body weight. So your bag yeah. should have weighed about 5 kilograms. However, in mm. reality, to fit everything mm. that you need for 7 days into 5 kilograms is near impossible. It is near impossible, and I think there is also actually a minimum weight um, on the on the bags. I don't know what the race rules say this year, but I think in my year it was something like 6 kilograms. Like if you had less than 6 kilograms, the, they would because they weigh your your bag before the race, the day before the race. And if you have too few supplies with you, they will tell you that and they won't let you start. So they weigh your bag, but they also go through it. It's almost like yes. a scrutineering uh, a section of yes. the race yes, just uh, where they go through all of your contents and they suggest you're not going to need this, you're not going to need this, but you don't have enough of this and this and this. Well, um, I, I didn't get any of that rundown, but <laughs> I think the, the basic concern is to make sure that everybody has enough food with them. Yes. Um, and that you have all of the compulsory gear. Um, and uh, don't take that lightly. The compulsory gear, it doesn't sound important at the time, but it, it does become crucially important. So, you know, you need a headlamp, you need a, a miniature first aid kit, you need whatever medications you, you need, you need like um, extra clothing um, for at night. So, so don't skip over the compulsory gear. David, you have done so many of these races before. When you've hit that mental barrier, how do you overcome it? Oof, um, again, I, I use the word, you know, on one level, on a physical sense, I think it's the, the fuss bite mentality, you want to finish it. But I think it, it is different for, for everyone. For instance, one of my big motivation issues to kind of get to the finishing line is, or was, um, every race that I've done, I've, I've dedicated to a specific charity. So... I always felt that if you use these races to raise money and support for an organization, you kind of you have a kind of an obligation to get to the finishing line because, you know, ending or withdrawing halfway, you know, it, it takes something away from kind of the bigger cause and, 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 and the bigger objective that you want to achieve. So that was always part of my motivation and, and, and both in the build up to the race, obviously during the race and the stuff that I've done for those organizations kind of post race. So so that kind of kept me busy, kind of get my mind moving and, and as Julie said, you know, one one foot in front of the next, get to the finishing line. You have to make peace with with your with your circumstances. It's going to be slow, it's going to take longer than what you used to. That patience on the one side. I think you have to take in the, the, the surroundings, you know, the surroundings can be overwhelming or the surroundings in, 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 in some way can also take your mind off, you know, the physical challenge and, and kind of the suffering and the discomfort that you, 
you're going through. I think the people around you also play um, a big role in, 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 you know, your experience and the success to get to the finishing line. You know, one, I think the Kalari Extreme Marathon is one of the best organized um, desert races anywhere in the world. You know, and I can say that with, you know, with all the, the confidence, having seen what other people do or, or don't do. So I think you will be taken care of before and after the race and during the race where where the, the organizers can do something for you, Allah, in terms of, say, medical assistance. They will be there and they will look after you. So that is covered. You don't have to worry about that. I think then the people that run with you, there's going to be characters. There's probably people that you've known before or you know you're going to meet someone during the race that you really connect with be it that you run together or it's just it's something to look forward to in terms of the stories that you'll share at the at the end of every stage and i think you have to you have to really find something in all of these factors or circumstances to get you through one day to the next because day one probably will be easy because of the excitement and maybe the last day will be easy again because of the excitement that you're going to finish but then those five days in between, you know, things can really get tough in terms of your levels of discomfort, you know, be it that you're tired, be it that you have blisters, be it that you don't like the food in your backpack, be it that you don't like drinking lukewarm water, whatever it is that, that kind of adds your discomfort. You also have to find something in your surroundings, be it the people or the circumstances, or your bigger motivation for why you've entered in the first place to get you to the finishing line. Julie, you mentioned one foot in front of the other is all important. But when you hit that mental wall, mm. what is your motivator to push you to finish that stage and ultimately finish the race? So I think um, before I get to what's the mental motivator in, in that when you reach that space where you just can't anymore, I think um, there's a lot that you can do to postpone the onset of you reaching that space um, from a mental perspective. Um, so it, it's inevitable that in a race, as long as KM, you are eventually going to arrive at the point where you just feel like, you know, I'm done, I'm finished, I don't want to do this anymore, get me out of here. Um, and You're making me feel a little <laughs> despondent because <laughs> I, I, I honestly, my mental mindset is... I will suffer the anxiety when the plane lands in Uppington. And basically, you're almost guaranteeing that that anxiety pre-race will be there, but that anxiety during the race will be there, and I personally will probably hit a mental wall. I wouldn't call it anxiety. I would just call it, you know, in South Africa, we say heartful. <laughs> I mean, you're going to get, a, get to a point where your physical energy is really low. Your, your mental in, and emotional energy is really, really low. And, th and that does become very difficult. But you are able to play little mind games with yourself to postpone that point for as long as possible. When I did came in 2018, in, in the same year that I was doing it, um, Erica de Blanche was doing it. And she's won KM on num a number of occasions. She's won the Grand to Grand in the US. And, and since meeting her at KM in 2018, she and I have become big buddies. And uh, she's also just published a book about what, running. And the one thing that she says in her book and that she says to me on multiple occasions is, um, you know, you worry about the weight of your backpack, you know, running through the desert for seven days. You worry about the weight on you. And she said that that's not your biggest worry. For an ultra distance runner, the heaviest thing that you carry with you is your own thoughts. And, and when I read that in a book, it was like a light bulb moment going on for me because, you know, we've all done it. You know, you go for a long training run. Maybe you go and do a marathon or whatever, and you get to that point in your training run, it's like your Saturday morning long 50k or whatever. You get to that point maybe around 25, 30k's where you're like, ugh, you know, this is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired now. I want this to be over. When am I going to get to the end? It's those negative thoughts. When you let those negative thoughts in, that's when your day starts getting bad. I call it, it sounds very dramatic, but I call it you opening the door to darkness. Okay. Because it's just that first negative thought. You let that sucker creep into your mind and it's just a flood. And from then on, you're like, ah, oh, my feet hurt. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I want to get there now. Why is it taking so long? And as soon as you start letting that tide of that tsunami of negative thoughts into your mind, then your day starts becoming so much more difficult for yourself. 
But if you don't let that first negative thought in, if you practice extreme, and you have to be mercenary with your mental discipline. You just have to like think to myself, okay, I have a, I've, I, in, in my mental space, there's a, there's a door behind which all my negative thoughts are. And in front of that door, there's this big bouncer. And he, every time one of them wants to come in, he says, oh, you're not invited to this party, stay out. And you just have to be really disciplined about that. Every time you feel yourself thinking negatively, you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look around me. How often do I get to run in a beautiful wild space like this? It's a privilege to be here. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to chat to the person running next to me. Um, I'm gonna Do whatever you can just to hype yourself up. Keep yourself positive. Even if your feet feel like they're falling off, you can stay positive. But it's purposeful. And it's a decision that you take. And I, I would actually suggest to, to practice this before you go to the Kalahari. You need to practice this type of ultimate disciplined thinking to remain on the side of positivity for long stretches at a time. Because it's really difficult to do that on a long run, like if you go and do a 100 miler or a 50 miler or whatever. But in the Kalahari, you've got to do that for six days straight, no? And that's not easy. That absolute mental discipline. Um, so why I'm telling you all of this is because I do think that you can postpone that point, that, that point where you reach physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion, you're in this dark place, put it off for as long as possible. Once you get there, once you're in that space, look, then it's just pure willpower. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just like, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I've acknowledged it, the negative thoughts are here, I'm feeling negative. Then it's, it basically comes down to your character. Your willpower is going to take you to the end. In the last episode, when I was speaking to Benny and Russell, I asked them how much of the duration of the race itself are you alone? And a lot of them said... Mm -hmm. A vast majority of it, because if you have a look at KM, there is up to 100 participants. So if you have a look, if you're traveling a 50 kilometer day and you spread those participants out over the 50 kilometers, the chances are 50 or 75 percent of that time you might be walking alone. Yeah. And for a lot of people, their own enemy is their thoughts and being alone with their thoughts and there are no distractions of other athletes near you. The only distractions that you have are either internal thoughts or your surroundings. Mm. How distracting are the surroundings? Well, I mean, you talk about being alone for, for long stretches at a time. I, I don't find that problematic. I actually prefer to run alone. Um, I'm a little bit antisocial when okay. I'm running. So, and I know that that's different to a lot of other runners actually prefer to run with a friend. And I can remember the one day, I think it was um, on the, David, I don't know if you can remember, on the, on the third day, we came out of the start of the race up this very, very steep ravine. And it was a really, really long climb. And then after we got to the, I think I lost my religion on, the, on that climb at the very start of that day. But then after we got to the top of that climb, it was like these undulating hills that just went on for hours. And at one point, I, I ran up to the top of this little hill. And I realized I had this amazing view of that I could see for miles. So I looked, I could see the, the route markers going off into the distance in front of me. So I looked out and I couldn't see any runners in front of me. And I looked behind me and I realized I couldn't see the runners behind me either. And that's how much we had actually spread out over the desert. And I was just so happy. Because I thought, it, it really, as I said earlier, it really is a privilege to run through that landscape. You see parts of the Kalahari that are not open to the public on any normal. You, you will see parts of the world that you would never normally get to see. So I just thought, you know, I do so much running. But how often do I get to run all alone by myself through this incredibly wild, wild wilderness space? And so I just focused on that. I thought, well, I am alone, but I'm going, while I'm here, <laughs> I'm going to take the opportunity to enjoy this wild landscape as much as possible. There is also that analogy and that short story and an anecdote about that frog in the pot of milk. And the frog is in the pot of milk and he's about to drown and he looks up at the top of the pot or the jar and he has no idea how he's going to make it out. And so he starts to kick his legs and kick his arms and what have you. And what he doesn't realize is the milk is starting to turn into cream. And so as he kicks harder and harder, the cream becomes more solid and expands in the jar. And so slowly but surely, just through pure effort and mental willingness, he manages to climb out 
of the jar. Is that relevant to what we're talking about? For sure. I think all the things that Julie mentioned, um, you're going to experience it. You know, running alone, the dark moments, etc., etc. For what it's worth, you know, you're not the only one experiencing it. So probably 99% of the people around you are going through the same things for, for different reasons or maybe at different stages during every day or over the course of the race. So in, for if that makes you feel better, um, you're, you're not alone. And that's why I think, you know, the, the friendships that you make during these races and the people that you meet, even if you never see them again, um, you know, for, for six or seven days, you've experienced something very unique. And if you can make it to the end, you know, that, that beer at the finishing line or the evening after the race just tastes so much better than any, or any beer that you've had um, before. And I think those are the type of things that you have to look um, forward to. So for me in every desert race, I think one of the big things that kind of can get you out of a out of a dark hole or, or adds to the motivation for the next day is probably, um, you know, in some races you can send emails, you can almost see emails live if, if, if they're set up in that way. In the case of Kalari, they give you a printout of messages that you receive. I think that's, that's critical for many people. That, that message every day, even if it's a one-liner or people telling you a super joke or some news or something to get your your mind off of what you've just experienced for the previous six, seven or eight hours makes a big, big difference. And, and, and I think for, for every, everyone doing the race to encourage people, to encourage their friends, their family, whatever, to send them the, those messages, I think that's, that's critical. Where Kalahari is totally different to any of the other races that I've experienced, and I think that plays a big role in getting people through Kalahari is the Orange River. You, you never know before the race starts when are you going to have a campsite next to the river, but probably you're going to have at least once and probably you're going to experience um, two campsites next to the river. And, and I think the, the benefit of taking, taking a dip in the river, wash your clothes, just feeling fresh, feeling clean for a change after having just you know, spent a couple of hours in 40 degrees heat it makes a big difference. It makes a hell of a difference. And it may just give you that motivation to get you through the next day. Because all the things that Julie said before, if you're looking for a reason to quit a desert race, especially Kalahari in the heat, if you're looking for a reason, you're going to have many options, many reasons to quit at any stage. And it can start on day one. So you have to look for things that are going to help you to manage those dark spots and get you to, to, to the next day or get you to the next water point. Because towards the end of the race, obviously, in addition to all the other discomfort that you experience, and you just obviously have to get tired. You know, if you do a comrades marathon, you probably do a long run of, say, 60 or 65 Ks a couple of weeks before the race. I don't know of anyone that's going to run 250 Ks over six or seven days in preparation for a Kalahari race. You're going to get to a point where you've never been before, be it that you're a lead runner or be it that you're at the back of the field. Um, and you, you just have to find ways and means of managing it in the moment, during the course of the day and ultimately over the course of the race. Julie, you mentioned to a large degree you're more of a loner type of person. But uh, it has been said many times that the camaraderie within this type of a race is one of the motivating factors. Did that have a negative or a positive effect on your progress? No, absolutely positive effect. Um, and I was surprised at myself because I'm, 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 I'm a loner because I'm usually quite an introvert. So I didn't know how I was going to deal with camp life and living seven days in the company of, you know, 60 other people. It was fantastic. And when I was out for the days running, I realized that I was actually missing the people in camp. So I couldn't wait to get there so that we could chat and talk. The camaraderie at KM is something else. It really is special. And, um, you know, even though I prefer to 
run alone on any given day. Um, on the very, very long day, one of the other runners and I actually decided to team up and it was the best decision we both could have taken because we got each other through to the end. We really lent on, you know, when I was going through a dark patch, Sophie was doing okay and she pulled me along. And when she was going through a dark patch, I then realized, okay, now it's my turn. I need to take over the pacing here and I need to push us along. But the... The other runners are just so incredibly encouraging. You also have to realize the type the, the type and profile of person that does a race like this is not a negative person. Um, generally, the types of people that go into events like this are super positive, really, you know, out to live, get the most they can out of life, real adventurous spirits. And, and so when, when you walk into a race like this and you find a camp full of super positive people who are incredibly strong willed, who are all obviously very fit, um, who are there to accomplish this, this terribly difficult thing, but they're taking it anyway. Remember, those are the types of people you're going to meet there. I mean, I, I met someone who had literally triathloned around the entire border of the country, Kim van Ketz. Um, so, those, I mean, for her, doing KM was like, it was like a fun run kind Walk of thing. In the you park. Know, exactly. So, these are the types of people you meet. It's impossible not to fall in love with everyone because everyone is just so positive and so encouraging. If you're having a low moment, there are five people that will come up to you and give you a hug. Um, when I was having my blisters attended to by the medical staff it was kind of sore so I had six people holding my hands and holding on to me while it was happening so they're very much leaning on each other being there for one another but if ever you're going through a dark moment you just have to just just say it just say guys I'm not okay and immediately everyone will come to your rescue one of my biggest concerns is up until now the discussions that I've had about KM have been with either super athletes trail runners I'm I'm currently in the company of giants and i have never run a marathon in my life i am not classified as a runner i'm a cyclist and i'm an active person but i'm not a runner and i've been trying regularly weekdays weekends trail running and what have you it's opened my life to a new facet but at the end of the day when i have a look at all of the people that i've spoken to in the entrance they're all these super athletes do you think me as a total novice is going to be accepted into this group of this family? Without a doubt, absolutely. Um, you must remember that you're, you're not going to be the only one who's not a trail runner. So in the year that I did it in 2018, and I know there was a number of other years where this was case, um, some of the people who do it are, are actually hikers and walkers. Um, and they're fantastic. And, and, and everybody becomes like a big family over the course of the week. It was actually Estian who said to me on the day that I arrived in Uppington, he said to me, OK, welcome to the family. You have a new family now. And it's, it's really true. So, so I, I wouldn't have any worries in that respect. Um, there's a number of people who literally set out to walk the entire thing. And they do because they're hikers. They're not runners. They're not trail runners. They've never done a comrades in their life. And that's OK. Can we just touch on a bit of the physical aspects of KM and the preparation and what have you? Dehydration seems to be one of the major contributing factors towards did not finish mm. DNFs. Mm. Uh, how does a person uh, discipline yourself to hydrate yourself often enough between the water points, but not just with pure water? Mm. Do we take electrolytes? Do we not take electrolytes? Because there is also the danger that you're taking too much electrolytes versus the amount of water that you're taking in. And so it can become a toxic situation. So I, th I would recommend that this is something that you practice beforehand. Um, so when you go out for your, for your long training walks, by this stage, I think everyone who's doing KM would at this stage be training with their pack on. Um, or at least you should really start if you haven't started yet. <laughs> um, uh, what the, the way that I had it, uh, did it was I had two water bottles in the front. One had water only. The other one was my bottle with electrolytes. And I alternated between the two. Um, so what's really important, though, to stave off the dehydration is um, you, you have to, again, practice a lot of mental discipline here. And that is literally remembering every 10 minutes I take a sip here. Every 10 minutes, I take a sip there. And then I, over and over and over again. So a lot of completing KM 
comes down to what I call self-management. People often ask me, when you're out there for hours and hours and hours, don't you get bored? And I'm like, no, there's too much to do. Because you have to remember, okay, now I have to sip some fluid. Now I have to sip some electrolytes. Uh, every 45 minutes to an hour, I have to eat something. I've got to monitor my blisters. If I feel sand in my shoes, I need to attend to that. So you're con it's like this constant self-admin. <laughs> you know, you're constantly attending to yourself. And part of that is the hydration and, and just trying to stave off the dehydration. And your electrolytes mixture, what did you use? What type of electrolytes? Was it a powder form? Did mm. you take salt tablets? I had salt tablets because I have a tendency to get very low blood pressure every now and then, so that just helps with that. I think the most um, commonly used form of electrolytes these days is a tailwind. So a lot of um, runners like Tailwind because it doesn't upset your tummy and it's got carbohydrates in it as well. And then there's a number of others. Uh, you know, you could take some Rehydrate as well. Every now and then I alternated with just, just a packet of Rehydrate. First of all, it's very light to carry and mm. small, so it fits nicely into your bag. Uh, but it just gives you those few extra electrolytes and makes you feel a bit better. David, when you suffered with such a low blood pressure during came 2018, that wasn't due to dehydration, was it? No, no, dehydration was <laughs> was the least of my issues. Um, I got to a point where, you know, whatever whatever water was available, I consumed that very quickly. So um, water wasn't the issue, hydration wasn't the issue. It was obviously something um, very different. Um, but what I would add to what Julie said, I think the, the question of what you use and how you use it and how you manage it, that's a very personal thing and you have to train and practice with it before that, you know again it's 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 the heat issue some some things you, you can manage but in in terms of how you prepare for the race um, and if, if you and if you have to experiment experiment before the race don't don't arrive in at the race and say I'm going to you know I've, I've just heard about something I'm going to test it during the race I think that would be very bad advice and probably is going to come back um, to bite you so I think it's very personal um, and different things will work for, for different people in, in different ways. I think the one thing which is probably very difficult to train for, prepare for, is to, um, which I've seen people just don't, can't um, handle, is drinking lukewarm water. You go for a 10 or 15k um, training around, you come back home and you, you, know, you take a bottle of water or take some ice from the fridge and put it in your water and you drink it. For, for seven days, you're going to drink um, not room temperature. You're going to drink something very different to room temperature water. And um, the longer the day, by the time that you get to a water point at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that water has been standing there since 6 o'clock in the morning. And some people find it very difficult to stomach that. So that probably for me would be very difficult. I've never trained for that to kind of deliberately drink lukewarm water. But, you know, if you have a problem, you know, getting it into, into your system, that, that is probably something to, to, to think about. You say it's very important not to test something on the day of the marathon. And I can ascribe to that just a quick anecdote. And this is to what a degree a novice I am. I've been looking for a really good electrolyte substitute to put into my water. And I've compared all of them. And the ones that seem to have the greatest amount of mix of electrolytes were two companies and they both produce an effervescent electrolyte. So I thought, well, they're marketing this for people that need electrolyte supplements and what have you. So they must have taken it into consideration that you can pop these tablets into your water bottle. Now, I also have two of those water bottles that sit on the front of my, my backpack. And when you close the nozzle, effectively it closes it. So about three weeks ago, I was in the middle of one of my long trail walks and runs, and I thought, this is the perfect time to now try this electrolyte. And in order to save time, I thought, let me just pop the electrolytes in both of my bottles. So that's what I did. I took two tablets, popped it in the first one, two tablets, popped it in the second one, and off I went. And off I went for a total of 30 seconds because I experienced an avalanche and an explosion of red water <laughs> on my face, yeah. on my hair. And I thought, okay, fine. <laughs> the solution to this is I'll drink 
half of each bottle. Now, considering I still had about three hours of walking to do, I thought, well, the only way to, 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 to leave this problem is to drink half of it. It makes no difference. You drink three quarters of it, and for some reason, that water still bubbles out. So the following week, I thought, now I'm going to make a plan because I always make my mixture the day before. So the day before, I popped these tablets in half a bottle of water in each of them. And the next day, the same thing. They don't stop bubbling. And it doesn't matter how long you have the water in there. And even if you leave the spouts open, the water just avalanches out of your bottles. So effervescent uh, electrolytes are definitely not the solution. I had the exact same thing happen to me. So I'm but, not alone. But at KM, <laughs> while I was in the desert, <laughs> my water bottle just exploded here in the side of my neck and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then I realized it's the effervescent and you've closed the bottle and the gas is building up in there and it's, it's the, the volume is too much for the bottle. So I had, I had the same explosion. It's happened to all of us. Don't worry. Moving on to your stomach. A person would think the primary reason why you would get sick is due to spoiled food. But I believe that the extreme heat can also play havoc on your digestion. Did any of you suffer from upset stomachs? I didn't. Um, I, I don't usually suffer from an upset stomach from running, or, although I know it's very common. Um, I can believe that the extreme heat can um, can upset your tummy. That, that goes without saying. Um, but I think for me, a very important tip is... Um, and this is going to sound silly, but wash your hands. Wash your hands as often as you can, especially when you're in camp. Think about it. You've been out all day. You're sweaty. You've been taking your shoes off. You've been wiping your face. You have bacteria on your hands. And now you stick your hands into your backpack and you take out an energy bar and you're eating with that same hand. So that bacteria on your hands, I mean, you get your five liter water bottle every day um, when you get to camp. What I did was I immediately decanted some of that water into a smaller water bottle. And that was my hand wash bottle. So I had my hand soap and my hand wash and I just washed my hands ob a, a, a lot because you, can, you, you need to do what you can to prevent bacteria from getting into your gut. David, do you carry any type of sanitizer? I think sanitizer in most desert races um, are, is, is a compulsory item. Um, desert races is a kind of uh, good preparation for, the, for, the, for COVID over the past two years because as Julie said, you, know, you, have, you have to kind of clean your hands and you know, where there are kind of... Uh, toilet facilities there's always hand cleaner you know whatever so because the race organizers also understand you 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 can't have a buck running through a campsite um, that would kind of kill a race in, in 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 no time so so i think people you know it's kind of an unwritten rule you you have to take care for for yourself but also by implication protecting people um, around you when you're actually taking part during the day, and I'm not referring to your morning breakfast and your evenings and what have you, but I think it's very difficult to discipline yourself during the long walks to keep on eating food and what have you. Foods like real food versus energy foods, the supplements, the drinks, the bars and what have you, which one wins out of the two? I, I would say, you know, take a, a healthy sort of, you know, a quantity of both. Um, you know, just in terms of convenience sake, it's going to be difficult to eat what we call real food when you're on the run. Um, but you, you don't really want to have to survive on energy bars and energy gels for seven days. So for me, I had, I had a little bit of both. I had some um, nuts and some crackers, but then I also had energy bars and energy gels as well. David, you've done this so many times. What's your winning formula? <laughs> uh, it took me a long time uh, to figure it out. Um, I, I like sweet stuff, but in, in, in a hot desert race, it seems your body craves for, my body craves for salt. So I quickly learned the trick about you take a packet of, of chips and you kind of put a, uh, you know, put a needle through it to get the air out. And you took a, a bread roller and you kind of crumb it. So you basically have seven cigars in your, in, in your, in your backpack. So at the end of the day, you take out a cigar and you... You eat that fine, um, you know, salt and vinegar, whatever your taste is, um, your flavor. Um, so salt for me was a big thing, including, you know, mm. you know, packet of peanuts uh, and, and stuff like that. Other people would prefer sweet stuff. My, my you know, wh one of the things that I've always struggled with is um, not to, you know, I've never had tummy problems, but I kind of lose appetite. So you almost have to force feed yourself because... 
after a long day and you're hot and you're tired, you just don't feel like eating, but you know you have to get something into your system um, for the next day. Now, again, today the quality of freeze-dried food and, and the variety in terms of flavors, whatever, compared to when I started in 2010 is chalk and cheese. I think stuff is very sophisticated these days. You can get what I call plastic food that really tastes like real food. And you have to have a good meal at least in the evenings, uh, you know, in terms of your recovery for the next day. So if you struggling, struggle eating, you have to find a way of getting that stuff in your body, even if you eat in small portions over a period of time. So you have to eat, and if you struggle eating, you must find a way um, of getting it in your body, and maybe flavor, salt versus sweet, or, you know, if you like pasta and you don't like what, you know, some, some funky chicken and, and something mix that you find in your freeze-dried food, maybe, again, that is something to, to play around with, to test beforehand, and find something that you can relate to, and, and if you have to eat that for seven days, so be it um, if that is going to get you to the end of the race because you have to eat you have to get in you have to get those calories into your body um, by hook or by crook and and it's also important during your four or five or six or seven hours during the day that you you, you know you nibble on something be it it's a piece of drove water or biltong or peanut or or a bar or whatever so i think it's also again part of the discipline uh, because you can't skip, because you, then you can't catch up again. If you if you skip for, it's like again water and, and and hydration. You can't skip not drinking for an hour or two because you feel so good. Um, you may feel good, but you know two hours later suddenly the body starts reacting in a different way. So again, listen to the body, manage the things that you can manage, and and hopefully that's part of part of the reasons or part of the success factors that will get you to the finishing line. You have both mentioned nuts. Nuts are very high in protein. But often a person also eats trail mix and what have you when you're going on hikes and things like that. But trail mix contains dried fruit. Dried fruit like raisins and what have you are great because they're very high in carbs. However, at the same time, dried fruit is a laxative. Is this a problem during the run? Uh, I wouldn't know. I don't eat trail mix. <laughs> I don't get an upset tummy. Um, but you know what? Uh, like David said, uh, you, you have to taste these things beforehand. So before I went to KM, I tested eating two-minute noodles for three days to see how I would feel running on that, you know. So um, taste it. Um, don't have any surprises when you get there. But also, um, like David said, you know, you lose appetite. You do. And one of the things that you need to do then is when you're in the Kalahari, just recognize I'm going to eat now and I'm not going to enjoy it. Uh, you're not eating for enjoyment like what we usually would. You know, you're making dinner in the evening and you make something that you would enjoy eating according to the flavor, whatever. Eating doesn't become about enjoyment. You're doing it to survive. You're doing it so that you can carry on racing. You're doing it so that you have energy for the next day. So just lose any illusions that you're going to enjoy eating. It's, it's not going to happen. No matter what you're eating, you're not going to enjoy it. I, I think that I took too much food with me and I ended up not eating all of it. So, and, and it sounds crazy because, you know, you're doing all this exercise, you're losing all this energy, you need all these calories. Um, and so I took the, the minimum amount of required calories per day and I didn't even eat that just because you lose your appetite. It's so hot and you're so tired that um, you don't feel like you want to eat anymore. So, so you know, the, the whole purpose of eating when you're out there is completely different to what you're used to. Um, you're really just doing it because you have to know you're not going to enjoy it. Don't worry about the fact you're not enjoying it. You can have a burger when you get home. And the other thing is, if you take too much food, you can't get rid of it throughout the course. In other words, if you carry too much food, you have to carry it until the end. Even if after uh, three days you realize that you've got 50% uh, too much food, you're stuck with that in your backpack. Uh, precisely. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's like walking a tightrope. I went, I, when I was um, putting my bag together, I got one of the, you know, those little electric kitchen scales. I don't know if this was a bit OCD, so maybe you're going to think I'm crazy, but I got one of those little kitchen scales and I weighed everything. Mm -hmm. And if I thought something was too heavy, and, and, and that's when I started realizing how heavy nuts are. So I took half the amount of nuts that I was originally intending to take. I had like these long um, sort of seed bars because I thought, well, these seeds, at least they won't melt in the heat. Um, I cut all of those in half and, and wrapped them in new little bags, you know, just to get the weight down. I even weighed things like the shorts that I was going to wear in camp. 
And I saw that the shorts I was intending to take, they weighed like, you know, 15 more grams than another pair of shorts that I had. I took those shorts. Um, so you have to become a little bit mercenary with your weight when, you, when it comes to your food as well. So, yeah. And even after all of that weighing and whatever, you were still at was, 10 kilograms. I was, I was, yeah, I, there is no explanation. <laughs> I'm not good at backing light. <laughs> The big B word, blisters, with so much sand, people have said that is also another major contributing factor to your reduced time. Um, Gators, either of you wear gators? I have a very controversial opinion on gators. (laughs) I have been speaking to a number of people, and one of the concerns with the gators is that your feet overheat. Is that true? That's exactly what happened to me. You know, before I did my first game, everybody said, uh, wear gators. If you get sand in your shoes, it's going to give you some blisters. Um, and you don't want blisters. And so I wore the gaiters and w- all that happened was my, my shoes turned into an oven. Mm-hmm. And then I got blisters, not from sand. There was no sand in my shoes, but I got um, what I think were heat blisters. And I, I mean, I've done a lot of trail running now. Sometimes you get a, a, a blister on your foot because you have sand in your shoes. You know, if I've, I've done races along um, the wild coasts, along the beaches there without gaiters. Got a few little blisters the size of the pea. The heat blisters that I got, there were four of them and they were all the size of golf balls. So I would personally rather have a little bit of sand in my shoe than have my foot in an oven. And that, that's my view of gaiters. David? I heard what Julie said. Again, I think it's 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 a very personal thing. Is it you know? And and again, what works for you? I've I've always used gaiters. In the beginning, I had bad feet. I really struggled with blisters. And maybe the more races I did, um, my feet kind of got better in terms of um, you know, in, in in terms of running long distances and running in deserts, whatever. So I've always used gaiters. But I think it's a very personal thing. Um, if you, if you, I think if you don't run gaiters, especially with ra- gaiters in, in, in a race like the Sahara or especially in, in, in the Kalahari through the dry riverbeds and you get sand in your shoes, you, you must just be disciplined in terms of say cleaning your shoes. I think that's, if, if gaiters are, if you use gaiters for the sake of keeping sand and, 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 and little pebbles, whatever out of your shoes, um, great. Um, maybe there's a trade-off with maybe your feet overheating, whatever. But then if you don't wear gaiters and you, you're going to run through patches where obviously you're going to get stuff into your shoes, just be disciplined. Um, you know, Julie talked right in the beginning about kind of managing your time, being patient, whatever. I think this is a, a perfect example. Those few seconds that you may have to stop to kind of clean your shoes, um, which potentially may prevent you from getting a blister by, you know, by getting stuff out of your shoes. Um, it may take a few seconds, it may take a minute or two. So what? You know, if you do get blisters because you didn't clean your shoes, um, the discomfort that you're going to experience further down the line during the race, it far outweighs um, you know, in, from a negative vis-a-vis those few seconds or minutes that you took to kind of clean your shoes. So. Definitely personal choice. Again, I think you need to, to run with it, train with it, decide what works for you. Some people would use full gaiters. Some would only use gaiters that kind of cover the, the back of the, the shoe or the ankles, whatever. So again, there, there are different options. Again, I think gaiters these days are also 10 times better than mm-hmm. gaiters 10 years, 10 years ago. So as with all other equipment and gear and stuff, I think there's a lot of improvement. Um, but at the end of the day, use stuff that works for you and that you're comfortable with using especially in in kind of the circumstances that you're going to experience in in the Kalahari. Just a final thought now. We have minimal time now left until the 6th of October. We have to be in a specific type of mental mindset moving towards that flight that takes off en route to a Khrabi's. Could be the best, could be the worst flight of my life. What mental mindset should I be in right now? Well, I would say um, don't be nervous um, and focus on why it is that you decided to do this race in the first place. 
you need to be excited and looking forward to, you know, I mean, I always think that, you know, when it comes to, if you can compare this type of race uh, in a way that the lay person would understand, if you think of what Everest is to mountaineers, a seven day stage race in the desert is an Everest to, you know, people who like to cross long distances on foot, trail runners, hikers, and so on. Um, so, so as much as there's a lot to prepare for, um, enjoy the process. Um, like Benny was saying when you interviewed him, you know, all the preparation is actually half the fun. You know, it's fun to think about oh, what, what gear am I going to use, trying to plan things out. Um, and, and it really is a once in a lifetime bucket list type of thing. So don't, don't spend any energy or expend any energy on being nervous or being scared. Enjoy the process. Think about why you decided to do this race. Look forward to that flight. Uh, be open to meeting all the new people that you're going to meet when you get there. Just enjoy it. I can't agree more. Everything that Julie said is, is spot on. Seven days, unique environment. Go and enjoy it. Seven days without a cell phone, without the internet. It's just you and people around you that probably are there for similar reasons to you. It's a, it's a small group of people. Um, it will be a fantastic experience. Mm. And, and, and obviously you're going to suffer along the way, but that, that makes the experience or what to look forward to by running across that finishing line, um, it's going to be very special. And um, Julia has done it once, I've done it twice. On, on both my occasions running Kalari, that race really kicked my butt for different reasons. But trust me, you run across that finishing line. Um, it's going to be very special. And um, I've made peace with it. I may never run a desert again. But just the last day or two thinking about this interview and again reading up about the Kalahari and whatever. Uh, this, is, this is a very unique race and it's going to be a very unique experience. So enjoy it with all the pain and suffering that goes hand in hand with it. David Barnard and Julie Reed, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much.